To many pastors, seminarians, and congregation members from all over the world whose hope is in heaven, greetings. I am Che Hyuk Yu, your presider for today. First of all, I would like to give thanks and glory to God for opening the Shincheonji Online Seminar. Before we receive the word at this time, we will gather our hearts and pray. Holy Father God, you who are full of love and grace, we sincerely want to thank you for giving us this precious life and breath and for continuing to guide us to live in your love. In particular, at this time, please fill your precious children of faith who have come to the testimony on the parables of the secrets of heaven and their true meanings, Shincheonji Online Seminar, with great grace and love. Now is a time when the new covenant revelation promised by Jesus' blood is fulfilled. For the churches that hope for the kingdom of heaven, Jesus sent his messenger, the chairman of Shincheonji, according to the words of the new covenant and had him testify to the entire events of Revelation. So not long ago, the chairman of Shincheonji and the 12 tribe leaders who were sealed through the chairman gave the testimony on the prophecies and actual entities of the book of Revelation to the whole world. As a result, many pastors from around the world have signed an MOU with Shincheonji to become one. God, may you be glorified. Now, center instructors who have been taught through the 12 tribe leaders will clearly testify to the revealed theology, introductory lessons on the parables of the secrets of heaven and their true meaning. So what we sincerely desire is that the eyes and ears to see and perceive the Bible may be granted to all family members of faith who are receiving the words of testimony today and that each will be led to enter inside the Bible and have a faith that is one with God, Jesus, and the truth. Please control the lips of the instructor who testifies and lead from the beginning to the end so that it can be a precious time overflowing with grace and thankfulness both for those who give and those who receive. God, we give you all the glory and pray in the name of Jesus who atoned for our sins. Amen. Shincheonji Online Seminar, Testimony on the Parables of the Secrets of Heaven and Their True Meanings. Continuing from the last time, we will go over Lesson 2 regarding the basics of the Bible. Through this word of testimony, I hope that it will be a precious time to give God glory by clearly perceiving what kind of book the Bible is, a book recorded by whom, that contains what, and why believers should practice a faith based on the Bible. At this time, we will welcome instructor Young Chol Park of Peter Tribe, who will testify to the Word of God. Greetings, pastors, theology students, and church members around the world who hope in heaven and eternal life. It is nice to meet you. Out of the Shincheonji 12 tribe leaders, I learned the revealed word from the Peter tribe leader, and I am standing before you as a center instructor. My name is Park Young Char. Our tribe leader learned from Shincheonji chairman Lee Man Hee the revelation theology and testified to it all. Likewise, I am going to testify to the words that I heard and saw without any addition or subtraction. So all of you are attending Shincheonji online seminar, the testimony on the parables of the secrets of heaven and their true meanings. So together with me, we're going to go over lesson number two on the basics of the Bible. All of you who are in attendance today have a Bible, right? Everyone, what is it like when you read the Bible? Isn't it very difficult? So a book, the book that is read the most, but in this world, we can say the most difficult book is the Bible. However, do not worry. 
because when we go over, once we go over the basics of the Bible at this time, then all of you will be able to understand the Bible. And furthermore, people around you will say, Wow, you have become a Bible expert. You will hear those words. So, please, open your ears and your eyes and open wide the doors of your hearts so that we can perceive these precious words. So, in order to understand today, uh, this lesson today, let's read the main reference of 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, it says, Apostle John says that the reason why the Bible is given to us is why? So that we know that we have eternal life. Uh, therefore, those who know the Bible well will be able to make known about eternal life and testify about eternal life. Isn't that so? And the basics of the Bible that we're going to look at today has eight major points, eight key points. So the first is that the Bible is a book of covenant. It's a book of covenant, meaning it's a book containing promises. So the Bible that we're reading is a book and there are words written inside. It's a book of promises, meaning it's a book of what? Covenant, isn't that so? And secondly, the Bible or words of the Spirit. It's God's book. So it's not something that men wrote. God gave it and it was written. So it's God's book. And thirdly, we're going to categorize the content inside of the Bible. So how can we categorize the contents inside of the Bible? What are the categories? And how can we view them? Is what we're going to learn. Number four, Bible shows a work of war. It's a history of war. So who's, wh what group and what group appear and fight and wage war in the Bible? What is this war? On whose side are we on as we're fighting this war? We have to know these things in number, number four. Number five, we're going to see the importance of what? Prophecy and fulfillment. What is a prophecy? What is fulfillment? Why are they important to us in our faith walk? Let's find those things out. Number six, we're going to see the seven periods of time in the flow of biblical history. There are many eras that we see in the Bible. Then what era are we living in today? We have to confirm it. And number seven, Let's look at the order of the fulfillment of the prophecies. When we say order, it's talking about a sequence, right? So prophecies do not fulfill randomly. They fulfill in a specific order. So we need to learn that. And number eight, God's objective of writing the Bible. What is the objective? is to save us from the wages of sin, which is death, to save us and to what? Give us eternal life. That was the purpose of why God recorded the Bible. Like this, there are eight key points in the basics of the Bible that we're going to examine together. Are you excited? If so, then one by one, let's dive into it. So, number one, The Bible is a what? A book of covenant. It's a, it's a words of promises. Then there must be people that are involved in this promise. So the Bible, it's a promise made with whom? The Bible says that those who have this covenant are the chosen people. So the Bible are words given to the chosen people. Chosen people we can understand in Psalms. 89 verse 3, it's those who are chosen and made a covenant. And there are many names given to the chosen people. It's not just the chosen people. Various expressions that show the chosen people. What are these names? Israel or Judah or Jerusalem. 
and Zion. So these are the names that signify the chosen people. So when you're reading the Bible and you see these words, you can think, ah, this is talking about the chosen people. Isn't that so? And the Bible, because these are words of promise, and to understand this in a big picture, in the perspective of a promise, the Bible has two big promises. What are these promises? It is the Old Testament and also the New Testament. So this Old Testament, it's an old covenant. And we can see this. It covers from Genesis to Malachi. And the Old Testament is made up of 39 books, right? That is the Old Covenant. And there is also the New Testament. And the New Testament, it's a new covenant. And we can see this, it covers from Matthew to the book of Revelation, totaling up to 27 books. So adding this up, we can see the Bible is made up of 66 books, 1,189 chapters, and 31,101 verses, words of promise. So the Bible, it's a book of a covenant. Now, let's examine this even deeper. Old covenant first. So old covenant, it was a promise made between who and whom. Who are the participants of this promise? The participants are God and physical Israel. And physical Israel, we say physical in flesh. They're heter heritary born, chosen people. And we say the Abraham's descendants are Jews, right? They are the chosen people of the old covenant. So God, he made a covenant with these chosen people in Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 to 6. So God, to them, through Moses he spoke, that they, if they keep the covenant, then they will become for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So he said these words. So just because they're the chosen people, that God blessed them, it's not so. As seen here, we can see, it's what? They have to keep the covenant. A promise like this, in the Bible, we call it a conditional promise. There is a result of keeping the promise and not keeping it. And we can see this in Deuteronomy chapter 28. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, to those who keep the promises, blessings are given, whereas to those who do not keep the promise, curses are given. Then, so this promise was made. But what was the content inside of this promise? The content is the law of Moses. So God's laws, they were given through Moses. In Exodus chapter 20, God to the Israelites gave them Ten Commandments, right? And together with the Ten Commandments, He gave them laws. And in Exodus chapter 24, it says, this covenant was made in blood of animal. And this promise that was made in the blood of animals, the, the Israelites keep this promise well. In 1 Kings chapter 11, we can see King Solomon worshipped Gentile gods. That's how he forsook the covenant. And that nation was divided into north and south. And furthermore, God to the Israelites said in Hosea chapter 6, verse 7, that Israel broke the covenant like Adam. So these individuals, we can see, they did not keep the covenant that was made with God. Therefore, God, through the prophets, promised the future events 
and that is recorded in the words of the prophets. And if you examine those words, you will see that because they were not able to keep the covenant, God is going to send a Savior who will save them from their sin. And that Savior, in the language of the chosen people, the Jews at the time, we call him Messiah. So a Messiah, Savior, is promised. So what is the content of the old promise? The old covenant, the main point, is the promise of the sending of a Messiah. So believe in him, isn't that so? If that's so, then did they keep this old covenant? What was the result of this covenant? Let's look at the result. The result of the old covenant. God, he sent a Messiah. Savior. And the Savior was who? It was Jesus. Therefore, God kept his part of the promise. However, people who waited, the chosen people, did not receive Jesus. This is how they broke their covenant. So ultimately, the people who did not keep the covenant at the first coming it was the religious leaders the Pharisees and Sadducees and also the Jews who were taught by them so why were they not able to receive the Messiah whom they have waited for for such a long time why were they not able to keep the covenant we must understand the reason isn't that so let's find out the reason in Acts chapter 13 verse 26 to 27 Let's read it all together. Brothers, son of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to us who to us has been sent the message of the salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which were read every Sabbath, fulfill them by condemning him. So in Acts chapter 13, it says that the reason why they were not able to keep the covenant is written clearly there. And the reason is because they did not understand the words of Jesus and the prophets that they killed Jesus. So Jesus came according to the prophecies of the Old Testament. He was the reality. And the words of the prophets were written in prophecies, right? So because they did not understand prophecy and fulfillment, they could not keep the covenant. We, in front of us, we have prophecy and fulfillment that we must perceive it so that we can also keep our covenant, isn't that so? Then just like this, because they were not able to keep the new covenant, a new covenant was made. And that is the New Testament. And the reason why the new covenant is given is because if there had nothing been if there was nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another in, in Hebrews chapter 8. Then with whom did he make a promise? Who are the participants here? It is Jesus and spiritual Israel. And we say spiritual. Unlike the chosen people of the Old Testament, they're eternally those who belong to God. Newly chosen people, new, they're, they're spiritual Israel. And we call them Christians. And who are they? They're you and, you and I. So they are the ones who are the chosen people. So let's look at the process, how they are the chosen people and the reason. In, in, in John chapter 1, verse 11, we can see that those who received Jesus were given the right to become a child of God. So they are the new chosen people. Then what is the covenant that is made with them? And first it is free law. The free law. Unlike the law of Moses, it's not only our actions, but it's also the mindset and our heart. The regulations for, for that. And we can see this in the representative chapters of Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. So from sin, to free people from sin. So that's why we call it the law that gives freedom. The promises of the New Testament began in Luke chapter 22, verse 14 to 20 says, that on Passover night, with Jesus' blood, a new covenant was established. Then, this new covenant that began, what was the reality? What is the reality that appeared? And the answer is revelation. 
Going to the book of Revelation, we can see how Jesus' blood appears in Revelation chapter 1, chapter 5, Revelation chapter 7, and also in Revelation chapter 12, it works. With Jesus' blood, people are free from sin. Kingdom and priest appears, and a multitude in white appears, and it's also used to fight against the group of the dragon overcome. Therefore, with Jesus' blood, a new covenant was established, and that blood takes into effect in the book of Revelation. Then Revelation is the reality of the new covenant, do you understand? So, reading the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 20, Jesus shows all these things to John, and then he says, I am coming soon, referring to his second coming. Therefore, inside of the New Covenant, it is not only the free law, but it also talks about the prophecies of Jesus' return. We must perceive this so that we hear those who keep the covenant. Then, this covenant, what is the result? Two things. Result of the covenant of the, those who keep it and those who do not keep it. Those who keep it are saved and they enter heaven, whereas those who do not keep it, they go to destruction and hell. Then how can someone keep the new covenant? In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10 to 12, this new covenant is to write God's law in our hearts like stamping a stamp and there's an imprint that is left just like that in our, on our hearts God's law must be recorded so that we can keep the new covenant then in order to do so we must perceive these words God's law and when we keep it what are the blessings that we can receive in Revelation chapter 1 verse 3 it says blessed are those who keep the words of this prophecy and that blessing is what? heaven and eternal life so there are also blessings that are prophesied for those who keep it However, Jesus, in concern that there may be those who do not keep it, he also said this. In Luke chapter 18, verse 8, when Jesus comes back at, the, at Jesus' second coming, will he see faith, he says. So today, on this earth, there are numerous people who have faith. However, why is it in the Bible? It says when Jesus returns, will he see anyone with faith? then it shows that this is not just common faith that we think about. It's what? Faith in prophecy and also fulfillment, isn't that so? So, let us not only believe in prophecy, but let's also believe in fulfillment so that we can be those who keep the new covenant that were spoken in, of in the Bible. So, this was the first main point. Let's, go, let's move on to the second main point that the Bible is words of spirit. So it's God's book, right? It's words and book of God. So even in the world, there's also an author. Then the one who wrote the Bible is who? It's not man, it is God. Therefore, the author of the Bible is God. But God is in spirit. So how was he able to record the Bible? God, he chose people and had them write God's will in every era. And they, we call them writers. There are approximately 35 to 40 writers the Bible was written. And they wrote on behalf of God. For example, I myself, I'm writing using this pen, right? So the author is me, but this pen is a tool. Like this, God is the author, and God, in every era, had prophets and the Lord's disciples use as a tool, as a pen, to record the Bible. If that's so, then what was the method in which the Bible was written? It was, it was God breathed. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, the scripture was written with God's breath. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, it was those who were carried along by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. 
Isn't that so? So the method of how this was recorded is what? Being carried along by the Holy Spirit. Then the question is, are, are all teachings that are taught with the Bible God's teaching? The Bible says there are two kinds of teachings. What are the two kinds of teachings? It is the teaching of the Holy Spirit and also man's teaching. Everyone, which teachings do you desire to learn? The teaching of the Holy Spirit or the man's teaching? We all desire to receive the teachings of the Holy Spirit, isn't that so? Then we have to know and to be able to discern. So first, let's look at man's teaching. Man's teaching, it's man's teaching. It's man's philosophy. How men in arbitrarily interpreted the Bible and teaching it with their own thoughts. So how did men's teaching come about? In Revelation chapter 5, there is a book in God's hand, right hand. And this book was sealed with seven seals. And because it is sealed, there is no one who can open or even look inside. This book that is sealed, what book is this? The answer is found in Isaiah chapter 29. In verse 9 to 13 it says, This vision is like a sealed scroll, meaning a vision. Vision is what is sealed, isn't that so? A vision is referring to the things of the future. It's a prophecy. So prophecies are what? Sealed. Therefore, the book that we find in Revelation chapter 5, because it is sealed, we can, we can now understand it's a book of prophecy, isn't it so? And like this, no one can understand the prophecies. However, they still taught it. That's when men's teaching came out. So what is men's teaching? Men's teaching is what? Taking God's words and interpreting it with men's thoughts and teaching it. And men's teaching, when is it made? It, the, when Isaiah chapter 29 fulfilled at the time of first coming, at the first coming, that's when men's teachings were taught. The people at the first coming, in order to keep the, teaching, the teachings of men, they did not keep the teachings of God. And they followed tradition and they forsook God's commands. So what are traditions? Traditions are teachings that have passed down for a long time. Those are tradition. And because they were trying to keep the tradition, they could not keep God's commands and they actually just abandoned it. And when they're inside of men's teaching like this, what was needed? It was the promised teaching of the Holy Spirit. Theology. So the teaching of the Holy Spirit, we call it theology, we call it revelation. It is not sealed, it is revealed. The one who, the, a person who delivered the words of revelation like this, at the first coming it was Apostle Paul. And looking at Galatians chapter 1, Apostle Paul says, the gospel that he preached was not received or was I taught by men. Meaning it's not man's teaching. All of this, he received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. So he learned it as a revelation of Jesus Christ. That is theology. And like this, through revelation, the one who learns it is the one who receives the theology teaching. And we call them theology students. It's not that one goes to a theology school that they are theology students. Those who learn the teachings of the Holy Spirit are the theology students. Then, how is this teaching? Where is it taught? How is it taught? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, God, the, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. So it is because it is written by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has to make it known to us that we can know the deep things. Then how does this play about? Isn't that so? Looking at the book of Matthew, at the first coming, Jesus spoke the things regarding the kingdom of heaven in parables. So the things regarding the kingdom of heaven is spoken in parables. So why did he speak in parables? And the reason is because in Psalms chapter 78 verse 2, 
A prophet long ago says he will order hidden things, things from of old. In parables, so this is the reason why Jesus spoke in parables, but this does not remain as parables forever. And at an appointed time, he said there will be a it will be spoken plainly. Then at a point in time, the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, the parables will be able to make known plainly. And the method to know is found in the title of the seminar. What kind of seminar are we attending today? It is the testimony on the parables of the secrets of heaven and their true meanings, isn't that right? So these secrets of heaven fulfill and the reality appear. And the reality, we can with this reality, we can perceive the secrets and the parables of heaven. And with this perception, we can enter the promised heaven. Therefore, at this time, through the teaching of the Holy Spirit, through the teaching of Revelation theology, let's be those who enter heaven. Like this, we saw the second main point of the basics of the Bible. Now let's move on to the third point. Third point, we're going to categorize the contents of the Bible. How many categories can we find of the content of the Bible? It is four, which are history, moral lesson, prophecy, and fulfillment. Then, how can we view history? History are the events that took place in the past, and we have to view it as examples and warnings. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, referring to the events of the time of Moses, in verse 11 it says, on us, on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come, these things are a mirror and warnings. So we use a mirror to see our own reflection. When you look at a mirror, you see yourself reflection, right? Just like that, the history in the Bible, it's like a mirror that shows ourselves. And with this mirror, we have to take warning, isn't that so? This is the reason why history is given to us. Secondly, moral lesson. Moral lesson, how can we view this? And the reason why moral lessons are given to us is so that we can become a complete person, isn't that so? Like it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, with this trainings and rebuking, he wanted to make us mature, isn't that right, as God's people. So we also need to receive these moral lessons so that we can correct things that are incorrect and fixed within us, isn't it so? And number three, there's prophecies. And the reason why prophecies are given to us, let's find out by reading John chapter 14, verse 29. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. Ah, in John chapter 14, verse 29, these things were told to us before it happens, meaning prophesied, right? So the reason why prophecies are given to us so that when they fulfill, when, when it happens, meaning when they fulfill, we can believe. This is why prophecies were recorded for us. So prophecies were foretold to us and the purpose of it is so, so that when it does happen, when it fulfills, we can believe. Meaning, it is the evidence that helps us to believe in the fulfillment. Therefore, we must know the prophecies well so that we can believe in the fulfillment that have appeared according to the prophecies, yes? And these prophecies are majority written in parables then we have to understand parables to understand prophecies. Isn't that so? Number four, there is fulfillment. Fulfillment we call the reality. What is this? This is what has been accomplished according to the prophecies. So in the Bible, there are prophecies in the Old Testament. When did it fulfill? They fulfilled through Jesus at the first coming. That's why Jesus at the first coming, he fulfilled the prophecies inside of the Old Testament. And what appeared at this time? Reality. That's why in John chapter 19, verse 30, Jesus says, it is finished, right? It is fulfilled. So he fulfilled all the words of the prophecies of the Old Testament. Just like this, the prophecies in the New Testament all fulfilled, and at a point in time, reality appears. 
When do the prophecies in the New Testament fulfill? They fulfill through Jesus at the second coming. This is why the scripture says in Revelation chapter 21 verse 6, once again that it is what? It is done. Like this, at the, at the place where there are prophecies, there also must be fulfillment that appears according to those prophecies. And for us, through prophecies, we need to believe in the physical entities that have fulfilled in reality. So, number three, we saw the categories of the content of the Bible and how to view them. So when you read it, I hope that you can view them in this way. Number four, of the basics of the Bible. Number four, we saw that the Bible is a what? A work of war. Very important here. The main point of the 66 books of the Bible, more than anything, it is that, that there is a war between those who belong to God and those who belong to Satan. That is the main point of the 66 books of the Bible. Then this war, how long has, has it been fought for? The length of war, approximately 6,000 years it has been. S beginning from the time of Adam to today, the fulfillment of Revelation, the Bible wrote about this continuous war. We have to also look at the kinds of war. There's what? Physical war and also spiritual war. At the time of the Old Testament, it was mostly physical wars. In the New Testament and also in prophecies, it talks about spiritual war. Then today, we are fighting a spiritual war. And furthermore, let's look at this even more deeper. The, the war, as you see here, there are two groups. It is God and Satan a battle between God and Satan. And who are the individuals who fight this war? It is the spirit and flesh that belong to God and the spirit and flesh that belong to Satan. They are those who fight. And the reason why they fight this war is why? In God's perspective, think about it, is to take back all creation that was lost and to restore them, isn't that so? that he fight this war. He started with Adam, but Adam broke his covenant and he, he got lost all things. And there was continuous sin after sin, even after that. So God, he lost all creation. In contrast, Satan the devil, he deceived, he lied, and he took away the entire world as its own so that it's not taken from him. This is why Satan the devil fights this war. What about the weapon? Weapons that are used. The weapon, it is the word of testimony. So God uses the word of testimony. He delivers and makes known the truth, the facts. Whereas Satan, the devil, if the truth is revealed, then the fact that he took away all creation and ruled over it as the owner cannot be made known. So, so to hinder this, he lies. And those who perceive the truth, or, or per, in the process of perceiving it, what does he do? He persecutes them. And looking at the Bible, he even goes to the point of murdering them, cursing, insults, and mocking them. And all these are what? Weapons that are used by Satan to fight this war. Then we have to ask, whose side are we on? If we're on God's side, then more than any other, more than anything else, through the word of testimony, we have to deliver the words of testimony and we have to deliver truth as those who belong to God. And, but instead, those who persecute and lie and trying to oppose and hinder the work of God, we can say oh, they are on Satan's side. So we have to understand the affiliation and belong to God. This is the work of war that we see in the Bible. And we can verify this in the Bible of the spiritual war appears in Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 to 11, there is Michael and his angels who fight against the dragon and his angels. And they're in spirit, right? So the spirits fight. However, there, 
There is also male child and his brothers who fight against the group of the dragon. They're in flesh. So spirits fight against spirit and flesh fight against flesh. So this is a war of spirit and flesh. In Revelation, we can see that at this time, the male child and the brothers, they fight with the blood of the Lamb and the word of testimony, and they overcome. So the weapon that they use is the, the blood of the Lamb and the word of testimony. Just like this, in Revelation, once again, there is a spiritual war, and the result of this war is the spirit and flesh that belong to God overcome. Therefore, the result of this war is that Satan is seized, is captured, and he comes to an end. Whereas God, he is victorious, and he, he eternally reigns. Like this, looking at the war inside of the Bible, we need to be those who are on God's side so that we can be victorious together. Moving on to number five, let's look at the importance of prophecy and fulfillment. And how can we understand this? So we have to understand that the prophecies in the Bible absolutely fulfill and appear in reality. So prophecies, they fulfill and they appear in reality. And to make this known, there are words that are recorded inside of the Bible. And that is Alpha and Greek. Alpha and Omega. So this is the first letter of Greek. It shows Alpha is beginning to start. Ome Omega is the last letter, last alphabet of Greek, and it shows the end, the finish. So God, when he begins this work, he prophesies. So he begins this work with prophecy. So that's Alpha. And by fulfilling the prophecies, he completes it and finishes this work that is Omega. So the fulfilled reality, isn't that so? So this expression is found only in Revelation. And the book of Revelation completes all of God's work with restoration and brings an end to all things, isn't that so? And these prophecies that are written, it says, do, do not add to or subtract from prophecies. What would be the reason, do you think? So God, according to the prophecies that he recorded, he fulfills as exactly as in the song. So if one adds to or subtract from it, one cannot keep the words of the prophecy. So one must never add to or subtract from prophecies. So this is how critically important prophecy and fulfillment are to us. And there was an example at the time of the Old Testament of prophecy and fulfillment. God made a promise with Abraham, and that covenant was, that promise was kept at the time of Moses. So that promise that was made with Abraham is found in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13 to 14. So he made a promise with Abraham, and that promise fulfilled at the time of Moses in Exodus chapter 12. Like this, prophecies fulfill. And also, the prophecies in the Old Testament fulfill at the first coming, and reality appeared. Prophecies in the Old Testament were recorded through Old Testament prophets and God he swore as he prophesied these things. And these prophecies at the first coming fulfilled through Jesus. And we can verify this through the Bible. Let's look at how Jesus came according to the promises in the Bible that he is the Messiah. Let's look at prophecy and fulfillment of the Old Testament regarding the Messiah, regarding the Savior. There are prophecies that were found in the Bible. Let's look at a few of them. First, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it said the Messiah will be born of a virgin. It was prophesied in that way. And this prophecy was given approximately 700 years before Jesus came. And, these, and this prophecy fulfilled at the first coming. And Messiah Jesus, 
He came, like he says in Matthew chapter 1, of a virgin he was born. And the virgin is Mary. And born of Mary, Jesus was the Savior. And in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, He says that the Messiah, this prophecy was given approximately 500 years before the coming of Jesus. And it says the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. It was prophesied in that way. And according to this prophecy, in Luke chapter 2, we can see how Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Like this, the Bible, even if it was a prophecy given 100 years ago, uh, later, before, at an appointed time, they fulfill. There, and in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 to 2, we can see how Jesus, it was prophesied that he will work in Galilee. And according to those prophecies in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus spreads the gospel in Galilee. And in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 to 4, It shows how there is a work of preaching the gospel of heaven. And in Luke chapter 4, it fulfills there. And even his death was prophesied. In Psalms chapter 40 and 41, Messiah will bear the cross, it was prophesied. And in Matthew chapter 27, he does. Therefore, All the prophecies in the Old Testament fulfilled and reality appeared. We verified through this, right? And Jesus is the one who came according to these promises. Then the reason why we must believe in Jesus, we can see in the Bible. Then, for us, we have the prophecies in the New Testament left for us. Then when do the prophecies in the New Testament fulfill? They fulfill at the time of second coming and appear in reality. This is how prophecies all fulfill. The prophecies in the New Testament, Jesus promised it through his disciples. In Matthew chapter 24 and John chapter 14 verse 29, absolutely God's words come to pass. And the reason why these words are given to us is so that we can believe at the time of fulfillment, isn't it so? Then, just like this, through the disciples are recorded all these prophecies in the New Testament. At the second coming, they fulfill. And in Revelation chapter 21, verse 6, it says, it is, it is done. It is fulfilled. Then who would appear at that time? It's not the writers that appear again. It is, according to the word, what? God's promised pastor who appears to fulfill the words of promise in the cell. And this shepherd is Jesus' messenger sent to the churches and he saw and heard the entire events of Revelation at the actual location. So he testifies to these words of promise. Then at that time, we must believe the words of prophecy and fulfillment and we can know the parables plainly. So what is faith that is needed at this time? It is what is the true faith that is needed at this time? It is faith in what? Prophecy and fulfillment that has appeared according to the promises. Isn't that so? If one only believes in prophecies, that's 50% faith. However, if we believe in prophecy and fulfillment that has appeared according to the promises, that's 100% faith, that's complete faith, isn't it so? Then we must not have lacking faith, we must have complete faith. And also, the Bible says these words, these, these words, it's a way, it's a path. Then the words of promise is a path for us. Then we must follow these words and walk on this path. And at the end of this path, we will be able to find the promised shepherd whom God has promised. Like this, we, see, we saw the importance of prophecy and fulfillment. So let's be those who perceive prophecy and fulfillment. Let's move on to point number six. It is the seven peri periods of time, the seven periods of era in the Bible, in biblical history. So what are the eras and why is it important to know these eras? In Luke chapter 12, Jesus said to the believers at the time that you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky, but you don't know how to interpret the present time. And then he says, why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? Isn't that so? And then he calls them hypocrites. 
And because they are unable to do this, then if we are unable to do this, then we'll be hypocrites. So be able to what? Discern the time, the era. Then what are the eras that are found in the Bible? First, it is, it is the era of Genesis, the period of Genesis. The period of Genesis when God chose the first man, Adam, and made him a living being. with the breath of life. However, he did not keep his covenant and he was kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And furthermore, like God's words, with the, with the sin of eating the fruit of good and evil, his spirit and flesh died. Even the descendants of Adam who sinned because they did not keep their covenant with God, God chose Noah, the ninth descendant of Adam, and had him build an ark. And he made known that there will be a judgment of flood in the world that sinned. However, until the end, they did not listen to that voice. So they were judged in flood. After this, the descendants of Noah, we see Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and their stories. And that is what? The period of Genesis. After this, God, according to the covenant that he made with Abraham, he comes the sixth descendant of Abraham, Moses. And through Moses, he keeps, according to the promise of Abraham, lets the Israelites, leads the Israelites out of Egypt. And to Moses, he gave him God's laws, and that is the law. So that era is the period of Exodus, the law. After this, Joshua. Work, the work of Joshua is also included in Exodus. After this, the Israelites, the people who enter into Canaan, they have to keep the covenant, right? But they, every time they did not keep the covenant, the Gentile nations invaded them. And at that time, God sent judges to save them. And that is the period of Judges. After this, the, Isra the Israelites, the Israelites, out of their desire, what was now appointed was kings, and we can see this in, and the kings were Saul, David, and Solomon. At the time of Solomon, that king did not keep God's laws and worship Gentile gods, so that nation was divided into north and south. Ultimately, they did not keep the covenant, isn't it so? So that is the period of kings. After this, God, through the prophets recorded the things of the future and that is the period of the prophets after this all the future events fulfilled that were written down by the prophets the old testament prophecies fulfilled and the messiah came on this earth and that was jesus right and god and jesus were one and so the prophets the fulfillment of the prophecies of the old testament and the events of the second coming, the prophecy. So those two things is what? The period of the gospel of heaven. The gospel of the kingdom of heaven. That's when the disciples and many pastors made this known, preached it in the period of the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And after this, after this time, as we can see in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, when the gospel of the kingdom has been preached in the whole world, and it says it will be preached in the whole world, and then the end will come, isn't it so? So the gospel of the kingdom of heaven has, after preaching it in the whole world, The last era has come, and that last era is the period of recreation and revelation. So, at this time, the promised pastor who received the revealed word appears, and he testifies to this revealed word. And all the people who lived in the previous era must be created again with this revealed word. And that is the era of recreation, revelation. And at this time, this is the last prophecy in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Everyone must perceive it and be born again with these words. This is the era of recreation, revelation. So we saw the seven different, seven eras. Then everyone, what era are we living in? Are we living at the time when the gospel of heaven is being preached? No, we're living at a time. of the era of recreation and revelation. Number seven, we're going to look at the order of the fulfillment of prophecies. 
In the Bible, how is this order promised? It is promised in the order of betrayal, destruction, and salvation. So betrayal, destruction, and salvation. Let's find these things out. And let's read what it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to Him, we ask you, brothers, not, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. Yes, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we can see to the brothers of faith what is, what is being said here. It's regarding the coming of our Lord and our being gathered to Him, isn't it so? So, we eagerly waited for the coming of the Lord, but it doesn't randomly fulfill. There's an order of how this fulfills. The first thing that we see is betrayal, isn't it so? And then the man of destruction appears. So what is betrayal? Is to break God's laws and to forsake it, isn't it so? That is betrayal. And then there is destruction. And then in the, in the midst of destruction, those who are saved and gathered, that is the work of salvation. And salvation completes with the coming of Lord Jesus Christ. So speaking, if, if anyone speaks about Jesus' the second coming, they must be able to speak about it in the order of betrayal, destruction, and salvation. That would be the true teaching regarding the second coming of Jesus. And at the time of this fulfillment, at the time of betrayal, the betrayers appear. At the time when the prophecies of destruction fulfills, destroyers appear. And at the time of the work of gathering, Savior appears. Then it's not only the prophecies, one is to be able to testify to the fulfillment regarding this, isn't that so? Now let's look at point number eight. It is that the objective, God's objective of writing the Bible is not the wages of sin, which is death, but to give us what? Salvation and eternal life. The beginning of the Bible, it began with sin, and there is the wages of sin, which was death. And that is written in the time of Genesis. The first man, Adam, did not keep his covenant with God. He ate from the fruit of good and evil, and therefore he died. He surely died, like God said he would. And in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says the wages of sin is death. So he, he died according to his sin, isn't that so? But in order to save us, that is God's plan. So what did God do? God's will is to give us salvation and eternal life. And we can say this in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, that what God wants is all men to be saved. And He wants us to come to a knowledge of the truth, to be saved and to be in truth. And there's an appointed time when this can happen. In John chapter 6, verse 40, God's will is to see Jesus, to look at Jesus and believe and to receive eternal life. And this will take place in the last days. And that last days is the second coming of Jesus, right? So God's will is salvation and eternal life. And the Bible that records God's law, what is the purpose, purpose of recording God's law is what? To give salvation and eternal life. Like the words that we read in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, those who believe in the name of the Son of God, it was to make known to us that there is eternal life. Isn't that so? And what is the hope of all believers? Salvation and eternal life. In John chapter 5, verse 39, even the believers at that time who diligently studied the scriptures, they did so so that they can have eternal life. Isn't that right? Just like that. So God and the Bible and believers desire salvation and eternal life. And that is written inside of the Bible that is in front of us that we must not 
forget the purpose and the objective as we read the Bible, isn't that so? So we saw the eight main points of the basics of the Bible, but let's look at the conclusion. First, is that all believers who hope in heaven must have the Bible as an absolute standard of our faith walk. It must not be man's teaching, man's thoughts, or arbitrary, arbitrary teaching. It, that cannot become our standard. Secondly, this Bible, which is God's book, God who recorded it through the Holy Spirit has to make it known to us as a revelation, revelation, theology, in order for us to perceive it. Then at the time, there's a promised pastor who appears who gives this revelation. Then we must be those who learn it and perceive it. Thirdly, we must pray to God to give us a heart of perception. And furthermore, we must meet God through the Bible. In John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The word in the beginning is God. And in the Word, there is life. So through the Word, we must meet God to receive life. Then, now, we can see the secrets of heaven, these parables, we must know it so that we can enter heaven. These words of parables, and at a point in time, because the reality appears, it can be made known plainly, and it can be testified plainly. Then, the secrets, the parables of the secrets of heaven will learn in the future lessons. I hope that we can perceive it well. In the next lesson, a, a, a lecturer who is more skilled than I am will come. So please attend and perceive the precious words. We must never forget and remember that in God and in Jesus, we are one. One here and pray. Father God, we are very grateful and very thankful that out of your grace, you've allowed to us the seminar of the testimony on the parables of the secrets of heaven and their true meanings and guided your children who loves you to this place. God, will you truly guide our, our footsteps and today we looked at the words of introductory lesson number two we saw eight main points of the basics of the bible so will you grant us perception of these things and will you also give us wisdom and perception of the parables that are promised in the Bible so that we can be led to the kingdom of heaven. God, will you help us to meet again next time and take control of our hearts and protect us in our spirit and our flesh. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for listening to the end. In Revelation 9, there are horses that kill a third of mankind, and the heads of these horses rest on their tails. Do these kinds of horses exist in the world? What is the reason that the secrets of heaven were spoken in parables? Then, if there was a time when he did speak in parables, won't there also be a time when he won't speak in parables any longer and clearly reveal the reality? To whom would the them group who do not receive the secrets of the kingdom of heaven belong? Shincheonji Online Seminar Testimony on the Parables of the Secrets of Heaven and Their True Meanings Today, we looked at Lesson 2 about the basics of the Bible. Pastors from all over the world who are listening to these words and believers who believe in God we are seeing the same words of the Bible under the same God. Even though our races, languages, and countries may be different, the sincerity of longing for the Word of God is the same, and we believe that there is only one Word of God's truth. We, the 12 tribes of Shincheonji, want to share the Word of truth with everyone in the world and want to carry out a faith 
to worship God in the heaven of freedom, peace, and love, free from sin and law. Currently, many pastors and seminaries who have recognized this earnest desire are signing MOUs with Shincheonji for biblical and cultural exchange. Shincheonji is open to all who long for the word. Pastors who want to sign an MOU with us through this seminar can join us at any time by contacting us by email or phone using the representative phone number. Lastly, we would like to express sincere gratitude once again to the pastors and congregation members around the world who joined us. We hope that you will join us next time and also until the end. We will conclude at this time and pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever and ever. Amen. Family of God, thank you to everyone who joined us.